f, and for me, I'll usually work over the complex numbers, but there are very interesting questions over the reals and over finite fields that I may mention a little bit. And let's say um, dimension of each vi will be some little vi. So if, if our vector space is just, say, Cn, say column vectors, um, we have the dual So from a geometric point of view, these are the linear maps from V to our ground field. Now I will switch to the ground field. Well, let's leave it, whatever it is for now. But if you just, you could think of this as, as row vectors. These will be the row vectors. And the linear map, well, some alpha will be some alpha 1, alpha n, eating a vector v, v1, vn, and then it's just uh, row column multiplication. Now, already here, um, I'm, I'm really interested in these things um, not the vector, but what it represents. This could represent some geometric quantity. And we may be, for, for example, we may be considered in bilinear maps. So the set of such will be denoted, say, V1 tensor V2. And for example, if I have V1 in V1 and V2 in V2, V1 tensor V2 acting on some alpha 1, alpha 2 will be just the row vector alpha 1 eating V1 times the row vector alpha 2 eating V2, just as they were over here. Any questions about the notation? Is it on purpose that the alpha is on the right and the v is on the left on the left side of the equation? We, yeah, it, it, it's because these are row vectors, these are column vectors. Yeah, but on then, the left and on the right side, you use an opposite order. Yeah, it, don't, it doesn't matter. It, 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 yeah, so the, the point now is, let, let's say I want to study all of these. And we want to think about what kind of invariants we have. So what do I mean by an invariant? Well, it depends what our setting is. So um, under, say, arbitrary change of bases, There'll be one answer, and then in certain situations, say under, say, unitary or orthogonal, there may be different answer. So there's, um, here we have the group, say, GLV1 cross GLV2, so this would be like, um, V1 by V1 invertible matrices and V2 by V2. So this group has dimension, say, V1 squared plus V2 squared. But this space has dimension V1 times V2 and so this is, say these two numbers are equal, this is, you know, twice the size of this. And because of that, we can use our group to change bases. And 
if I have someone who does not like me, hence be an element of this space, I could always change bases such that it looks like this. And so elements of this space, at least as far as under arbitrary change of bases, which is what I'll stick to in this talk, but we'll hopefully hear from the quantum people about where we're only allowed unitary change of bases. Um, there's only one invariant, namely the number of ones here. That's called the rank. And that's it. So, yeah. Just make sure I understand. Strictly speaking, the dimension is actually that minus one, right? Because you have the scalar. I agree. And it'll be worse later. And um, so as far as the geometry is concerned, we have a single number, and we understand these objects completely. Any questions? OK, now let's look at trilinear maps. And well, as before, we have uh, up to change of bases. So this space is written that way. And so this is, of, let's say, dimension of Vj is n for all j. So this is like dimension n cubed. But uh, our group well the now I'll since I have someone checking me for honesty. This has dimension um, 3n squared minus 2. So there's no hope of normal forms for n, say, greater than 3. Why? Why does this counted argument first of all? Well, so uh, oh, you say you mod out the basis change. That's not so I, I, I could. So the point is, is someone who doesn't like me hands me an element of the space, and I want to make it look as simple as possible. Now, over here, I could really make it. There's just a finite list, and even when n equals three, it's like Jordan normal form. You can almost do that because the dimension of the group is almost big enough to completely normalize, just as when you're studying um, matrices up to conjugation, they, you, you, you can characterize them completely with a normal form, Jordan normal form from linear algebra. But what I'm saying here is there's no hope of anything like that, say, very early on. Or, or even, let's say, uh, greater than four factors no hope already when n equals 2 even. And in, if you're going to do quantum computing, you deal with two-dimensional vector spaces, and you have a whole bunch of them. There's no hope of doing anything uh, in the way of normal form with your group. So, <laughs> so then we have a choice, right? So we say, OK, that we don't care about the group anymore, or we could look, still look for invariants that will help us chop up our space into pieces, and that each piece should have some meaning that we can identify geometrically, but we give up on writing a complete answer to the characterization problem. So, but then we can also ask uh, some questions. Um, what are reasonable subspace? I 
I mean, there may be, even though the whole space is just impossible, maybe inside that space there's some reasonable subsets, and those subsets have some geometric meaning. So, for example, here, um, this, this, is, this thing, if I represent it by a matrix, this, is, this will correspond to a rank one matrix. If I choose bases, I could choose this as my first basis vector, and this is my first basis vector. I got a matrix one in this corner, zero is elsewhere. And maybe there's an analog of rank one, and indeed there is. And this looks like you could literally, let's say we had a, a three-dimensional matrix, you could literally make this into a three-dimensional matrix with a one in the upper corner and zeros elsewhere. And so this is a, but this is a pretty small set. A uh, dimension of this is around, say, um, n times d minus something small. Uh, what is it, d minus one maybe? So it's a tiny corner of our space, but we can all agree it's, it's the simplest possible elements in our space. And then, well, what's going to be the next simplest element? The next simplest set of elements. Someone who's not in geometry, take a guess. Well, we could look at sums of two. And then you could still have a picture like this. But you could keep going, maybe up to n. And these are, the, although this space is hopeless to tame, even when we only have three factors, we could still tame this small subset. But what is, what is the dimension here? So the dimension of rank n elements here, well, that's basically your whole space. It's an open subset. If you take a random ma matrix, it's going to have full rank. But here, if I have sum of n, let's say, um, so this will have dimension n times roughly, just roughly counting. What was the other dimension? n times uh, d minus something small. But this is like n squared d, but the whole space has dimension well, what's the dimension of this space? Like if these three have n, I get I have a three-dimensional cube, there's n cubed elements. This is n to the d, which is a whole lot bigger. So our nice things are just some tiny corner of our space. And then the question is, well, is that a good corner to restrict ourselves to study, or should we try and go further? Or if we want to study random tensors, like random matrices, certainly we cannot restrict ourselves to those. So the question is what, what to do. So other reasonable subsets. By the way, 
I mean, let me just define the tensor rank. is the smallest r, so let me say, let's call it r of t, the smallest r such that t is a sum of r rank one elements. And with two factors, that was like, let's say dimension of v is n, with two factors, uh, the worst possible case here was like n was n, but if you do this back of the envelope calculation on the dimension, you see that the worst case here is much larger. Even when d equals three, you expect to go up to almost up to n cubed, n squared. Sorry, n squared. So there's. Um, so this is kind of um, the Rolls-Royce of invariance. Uh, it's not so easy to compute. It's not so easy to understand. Um, unlike matrix rank, um, this is neither upper nor lower semi-continuous. I mean, matrix rank is semi-continuous that you can sort of take a curve here, put an epsilon and make the rank drop, but you can't, certainly cannot make the rank go up. But here you can make the rank go up. For example, um, if I take uh, E1 tensor E1 tensor E2 plus E1 tensor E2 tensor E1 plus E2 tensor E1 tensor E1, this, you could check, cannot be written as a sum of two elements, but it's the limit as epsilon goes to zero of E1 plus epsilon E2 tensor E1 plus epsilon E2 tensor E1 plus epsilon E2 minus E1 tensor E1 tensor E1. And the geometric picture is I have a limit of points, and when I go to the limit, I get a tangent line instead of a secant line. So this, so these points are these points on the tangent line. And I take a limit of secant lines, I get a tangent line. So So we, maybe we should look for other feasible subsets, and those are supplied to us. Is, is it, does the geometric uh, intuition explain why the rank can go up in this procedure? Does my geometric intuition explain? Why the rank can go up or would go up in such a construction? Yeah, so the geometric intuition is that linear algebra is pathological, and if you define rank in any reasonable space, it should be pathological and go up and down. And it's only because the space of matrices is pathological that you have semi-continuity. Because you would not expect, so what happens in the space of matrices is, say I have a point that is on the tangent line in the space of matrices, then it's as, as if it were a plane curve, it will also it will also lie on a secant line as well. So the space of matrices, it's almost as if it were a plane curve. That a, any point that's on a tan, oh, I didn't want it that one, I wanted uh, this one. Any point that's, sorry, that's a bad picture. Any point that lies on a tangent line will also lie on a secant line. And in fact, it'll lie on a positive dimensional family of secant lines. And so the ge geometry completely tells us that linear algebra is, is just really exceptional. There's only a few other examples known in all of algebraic geometry where this phenomenon occurs. Good, that's a great question. Other questions? 
OK. So the other interesting examples are, well, that's the name of the workshop, is Tensor Networks. So other feasible subsets of this. And now, um, well, you could define them, but the question is, is uh, we want useful ones as well. And I had hoped to get uh, someone who does applications to give a sort of introduction to why tensor networks are effective, but we did not get a volunteer. But if one of you would like to volunteer during your talk, it would be very welcome. But a, a simple thing to do, one of the first things people did, is they sort of, um, maybe we're looking at something physical, like some um, atoms arranged on a line, and they said, well, if, if this is, if my total Hilbert space is modeling the ground state of, of some physical system, that the physical system has some geometry, maybe I should study some subset here that sees this geometry. And um, let me give a definition. So, of course, since you know we have people from different areas, everybody's going to have their own notation. So let me um, let me talk about tensor network states. So state is just an is an element of my tensor product of vector space. And this is some collection of such. And it will depend on, on, on some data, uh, so, uh, some graph, let's say with um, d vertices. And um, so to each vertex, we'll have uh, associated a, a labeled graph. So I'm going to, what are the vertices? Say V1, V2, V3, V4. And then um, attached to the edge, I'm going to actually give an oriented graph. And I'll, so I put some arrows. And um, maybe there's another one here. Then to each vertex, I'm going to associate, if, if it's pointed out, so let's call this um, E1, E2. The names of this don't really matter. And so uh, attached to V1, to vertex one, I'll get some uh, T1 sitting inside V1 tensor, E1 tensor, E2 going out. And then like say um, T4 will be V4 tensor. And now I'm not gonna do E1 because it's going towards it. So I'll do E1 dual tensor, E5 dual tensor E3 dual. So the, I have the vector spaces that are handed to me physically. And then these auxiliary vector spaces are going to be, think of them as small. And they will enable me to make a reasonable or semi-reasonable subset of this tensor product of five vector spaces. Think of each of these vector spaces as having dimension two. So I have a big vector space of dimension two to the fourth, or maybe I have you know, 10 vertices, 100 vertices. So I have two to the 10, two to the 100. And um, then I want to get some reasonable subset. 
And so I have now this T1 tensor tensor Td inside, say, V1 tensor, in this case, E1 tensor E2, tensor V2 tensor, well, is E2 dual tensor E3 tensor E4. Uh, I, thank you. Um, and now, just as it, we have this pairing, so this is kind of a God-given pairing that we started the lecture with. If I have a vector space in the dual space, I have a column vector, a row vector, I could contract them and get a number. So I could contract this down And I get it, this element of my starting space. And now, um, if, if all my vector spaces are of dimension two, maybe I should have some more vertices here, a bigger thing. Then, um, and let's just say I have something, a simpler graph than that. So. Um, so now, let's say I have 10, 10 vertices or whatever, or D vertices. So I have um, roughly speaking, um, in this case, so I get a three-way tensor there. So I get 2 cubed times D versus 2 to the D or more generally, n cubed n to the d. And, and this is, you, you would hope this is some tiny corner of our space that's reasonable. Now, the caveat here. So this is a general ease. I mean, hmm? this, so you're thinking of, of, the, of ease as just being some bounded. Yeah, so ease, this ease are, are, are small vector spaces. So they don't enter into your computation, right? Well, they enter in that I'm looking for some feasible subset of this gigantic space. And I say, well, despite what I was telling you earlier in their talk, three-way tensors are not so bad. And I'd rather have uh, this thing. So, so I have a, a subset parameterized. So let's call this T and S gamma, and then I have some vectors, dimension vectors. Where this tells me the dimension of, this is a vector telling me the dimension of these various spaces. And now I get some subset sitting inside here. Now, someone other than me will explain to you why this is just amazingly useful for certain physical problems. I mean, I, I, and, and what's even stranger is even if you just, even if you take this one, just this, this famous one that's just a, a, a chain or even, even simpler, just something that looks like this, it's, to me it's unreasonably effective for um, giving answers to certain questions in, in applied PDE. Well, applied PDE, they actually like ones that look like this. Uh, let me be more precise, numerical PDE. And I can tell you why they like this graph, but I cannot tell you why it's useful for them why it works. So, so I mean, a quantum physics integer is not so complicated for this 1D, 1D system. If you would have a 1D quantum system and you have an excitation gap, like from the ground to the excited states, and it turns out that spatial correlations decay exponentially in distance. If you look at two points, then the amount of correlation between them sort of decays exponentially as you look at further points that are further and further away from each other. Right? 
I, I, so in a way, sort of with a reduced set of degrees of freedom in each region, sort of, that's at least that intuition, right? I, I, I agree. If, if we actually are so lucky to have our atoms arranged like this. But the, the utility of this seems to go way beyond that. And I don't understand why. I, I completely agree why. And, but let me, let me tell you why a graph that looks like this or this is useful um, from a computational point of view. You want to approximate. Say, say we go back to matrices. People approximate matrices. What do they do? They do some singular value decomposition, and then they throw away all the small singular values to, to approximate our matrix by low rank matrix. Well, we could split these spaces up. I could do a cut here, and I could forget that this is a tensor, and forget that this is a tensor, view it as a matrix, cut it down, and then cut here, and cut here, cut here, until I'm in some reasonable situation. But uh, again, uh, we will hear other talks by people who understand this much better than me. And again, I understand what they're doing. I don't understand why it is so amazingly effective and, and why it's working so well. So hopefully, all by the end of the week, uh, my goal is to learn something about that. And um, my goal in this talk is to convince you that geometry can help you with these tasks for various applications. So for example, um, what was not known before geometry played a role is if it was not known that if I have a, a so I have this subset of, um, where is it? I, well, yeah, here we go. We have this subset of our space of tensors. And it was not known that if I have a sequence of tensors in this space, if the limit of the sequence still lied, still was in this space. And the answer is not no if you have topology in general. And at the end of the day, the proof was not difficult. But the way the proof was arrived at originally was using ideas from geometry. You don't need the ideas from geometry when somebody shows you the proof. You could write it yourself in simpler language. But to come up with it, the geometric perspective was useful. And Similarly, to understand, for example, this um, lack of semi-continuity, even of ranks, is, um, is, is it, it's useful. So now, let me, um, let, I, I, let, let's sort of simplify ourselves and study um, just three, three vector spaces, so I can go a little bit deeper into the geometry with just three spaces, and then I'll explain how um, you can extend that beyond uh, triples of spaces. So, um, so let me ask another question. So here I was asking about interesting subsets. And um, we saw two answers, say the tensors of rank R, or the tensors arriving uh, from some tensor network with some fixed space, fixed um, dimension parameters. Oh I, oh, I wanted to say a few more words about this, because sometimes, yeah, let me go back to this picture. So if have uh, Hilbert spaces, we can erase the arrows. Because we have the Hermitian inner product
to our ground field that will do the contraction for us. So if you're a physicist or quantum, you, you, you just draw the picture without the arrows, and you're fine, because you could contract. Well, that it's anti-linear in one variable. Yeah, but it's for, for contraction, of making, for making a subset of a set of tensors, it doesn't matter. Um, and then there's other notation. Some people only want to attach vertices to the edges, so they maybe put dangling edges. So there's, so there's other notation for the same objects. That's all. Right. OK, so let me, let me um, yeah. So now we were talking about interesting and useful subsets. Now I want to just ask about what are interesting and useful tensors, specific tensors. So let's stick to um, three ways, three spaces. Already you get some interesting things here. So for example, uh, let A be an algebra, finite dimensional. So that is a vector space with a multiplication. So you have a multiplication A cross A to A, namely A, B maps to A, B. So this is a bilinear map. So any time I have a bilinear map, this leads to a tensor, V1, tensor V2, tensor V3, with duals here. Because I could view this as a trilinear map. Uh, thank you. Yes, so I just take um, T of V1, V2, V2, and then I have beta, where beta is in V3 star. This thing will be in V3, and I get a number. And so I could convert this algebra to a tensor. And uh, we'll see some interesting tensors. And the most basic algebra of all is just the set of all n by n matrices. And um, right, so. Uh, so there's a fundamental question. So this, uh, so again, I could view it as so this tensor is a CM squared tensor. CM squared tensor, CM squared. Maybe I'll decorate these just to be precise. And it's a fundamental question. What is the rank or what is the rank within epsilon? This goes by border rank because maybe it's not of rank five, but I can get arbitrarily close to five with an epsilon. And it turns out this is this is uh, you know 1968. Strawson realized that whatever it is, it's less than m cubed, which would be your naive guess if you wrote it out. In standard bases. 
And it's actually, actually conjectured that it's like m to the 2 plus epsilon, something like that, for, for any epsilon greater than 0. And it's one of the two most important questions in algebraic complexity theory. And the other most important question is um, algebraic of um, P versus NP. So P versus NP is the, the question is um, if a problem is easy to verify a proposed answer, is it easy to find the answer, like traveling salesman problem? I say, you know, somebody has to visit 50 cities. Can they do it with tra a route traveling 2,000 miles? Um, the only way known to determine that is just to check all possible, you know, routes, which is a lot of things to check. But if somebody says, hey, sure, here's an answer, all you have to do is check that one answer, and that's very easy to verify. And um, the valiance analog of that is, um, is a polynomial that is easy to write down. Uh, easy to compute, also easy to compute, and the conjecture is no. And so probably you get something like a million dollars if you answer this question. What, what, what's the definition of two write down? Hmm? What is the definition of two write down? Right, so I could give you the definition if you like. That um, or or I could just tell you one such polynomial. So um, you know the determinant polynomial. Uh, it looks like this. So we have a n by n matrix. This is um, summation over permutations sigma. The sine of sigma times x one sigma of one x n sigma of n. That's the formula for the determinant. And this formula is easy in the sense that all the coefficients are either 0, 0, 1, or minus 1. And I can tell you whether it's 0, 1, or minus 1 if you tell me the monomial. And similarly, there's this polynomial of the permanent, which is even easier to write down. This is the one when I was first learning how to compute a determinant that I wish was the correct formula because then I didn't have to worry about where all those pesky signs went. Um, and and Valiant's conjecture, uh, he proved that if this one is easy to compute, then all such polynomials are easy to compute. So the conjecture is that permanent is not easy to compute. But write down is in the general sense, or maybe it's not important. I'm just wondering, right? I mean, it's not. I mean, there's a sum involved, and like, like how many? No, no, no. The point is, 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 if you hand me a monomial, I can tell you its coefficient instantaneously. So we have some fixed. We have some fixed basis of our vector space. You pick the monomial. I tell you its coefficient. Okay, that's that's a rule. It must be an easy way to determine. Yeah. Um, right. So why am I bringing this up at a tensor workshop? Because if we want to multiply, let's say, iterated matrix multiplication, and I think already for 3 by 3, so now I need D. So I have D matrices. So I have x1, xd goes just their matrix product. And um, to solve Valiant's conjecture, it's sufficient to show this. 
is difficult to compute. And I can make difficult precise. For example, we could do it in terms of its tensor rank, or tensor border rank, or tensor asymptotic rank. Well, whatever. Um, so there are some fundamental complexity theory questions connected here as well. Now, I'd also like to talk about more invariance of tensors. This is, you know, ostensibly this week is about tensor networks, but we shouldn't study them in isolation. We should study kind of all interesting properties of tensors and see how they're interrelated to each other. So, um, so let me, let me do two things. Um, I'll talk about the cost of tensors. So um, we already saw one, this tensor rank, R of t. So I remind you, this is the minimum R such that t is a sum of R rank 1 tensors. And then there's this tensor border rank, R of t. So this is the minimum such that t is a limit of rank r. And then there's something strange, um, something called the asymptotic rank. And maybe I won't define it, but you, you take many copies of your tensor and you compute its rank, and then you normalize. And so these are measures of cost. And they've been around for a while and well studied. So for example, um, the cost of a random tensor is known. But the cost of um, just about any any other tensor with any of these measures is not known. For example, um, this matrix multiplication, as soon as you get to three by three matrix multiplication, this is not known. Uh, the rank is somewhere between 19 and 23. The border rank is somewhere between 18 and 20. So, and, and that's very recent progress in both directions. <laughs> so we, we know almost nothing. For four by four matrices, it's like within a factor of two, we don't even know. So, um, okay. Uh, but then we also want to discuss the value of tensors. So let me rewrite this tensor rank in the following way. The tensor rank, um, we could think of R of t as uh, the smallest um, R such that there exists, um, uh, well, let me, let me introduce, yeah, I guess I need to introduce something called a unit tensor. So unit cost will be some rank one. And um, then I could look, uh, so up to, say, rank n, in Cn tensor, Cn tensor, Cn, we're fine. We can do those matrices, those three-dimensional matrices with um, R up to R1s along the diagonal and then zeros everywhere else. But we know rank goes bigger than N. So I need a, a better name. So we'll allow, let's say my tensor is in zone space A, tensor B, tensor C, we'll allow, say, a 
to go and sum some CR and same B and C. And so now um, we could make it as the, uh, the, the smallest. And let, let's call this thing, this thing R here, uh, this unit tensor. I draw it as a matrix, but you think of it as three-dimensional. The smallest R such that we have these, and then um, T obtained from R via a change of basis. Or for border rank via a limit. So see here there's this subtlety that if we have our benchmark object that we pretend we understand, we have to allow our tensor now to go in a more complicated space and use the easy object in the complicated space. It's, there's nothing much you can do. It's a difficult problem, so you have to suffer one way or another. And then um, we could talk about the value. So let's say we could write t less than or equal to some r. And we talk about the value, it's the other way. It's the largest r such that with the same picture, uh, t after change of basis can be converted to r. So this is called the subrank. So we think of these, these, these unit tenses as our, our, as our currency. So we're in US, so it's dollars, that's the basic unit. And then, you know, if I want to buy euros, there's, there's cost of euro and value of euro, how many I could get for my dollar. Um, and then there's, there's also this notion of border subrank. And asymptotic subrank. And these, so this, this we know almost nothing about. So unlike, well, the good news is if um, T is some structure tensor of an algebra, then can, uh, in principle, compute Q, Q or Q bar, but for random tensor, we have no idea. So it's kind of a opposite situation here where we know how the random cost is, but for specific cost, we know nothing. Here for random value, we have no idea, but for specific values, uh, we know a lot. And so there'll be at least two lectures on this um, mysterious topic of value uh, this week. Uh, Chang and Zridam. So I'm, it, it turns out that these, this notion was very little studied up until recently, and then there's been this explosion of work on it. And let's say you only care about quantum information theory this actually has a lot of interactions with quantum information theory, especially the asymptotic version. So I, I'm bringing this up because, not just because it's a beautiful topic and you should learn about it, but because it's actually relevant for a lot of the things that tensor networks are used for. And um, uh, yeah, so, but fortunately you'll hear at least two lectures on that, so I don't have to say much more about it. Please. I'm not familiar with the whole algebra. I'm a physicist, and uh, uh, I mean, the, the other thing that reminds me is uh, in the context of physics is when you do study states and density matrices in the quantum setting, so that's strictly connected. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? The density matrices in the yes. quantum setting, so mm -hmm. not necessarily tensor states, let's say, but still have a metrical structure there when one to study. Density metrics and entanglement related to that yes. in this context. Yes. And uh, I mean, 
in their the value that the students go more than two sets of products, per se, and the classification of all these stuff is very complicated. Yes. And if you want to describe entanglement, then I think you go back to situations like the one that you were describing here in which you are asking uh, how you decompose and the rank and something that just appears to me or do you know anything about that? Yeah, so it, entanglement is, is, is yeah. very closely tied to cost. Yeah. Yeah, and, but also to value, right? Because you want to, <laughs> so um, I, I don't want to say too much about that, but we have, Yaron is kind of world expert. Maybe he'll, he'll say a few words about it in his talk on, um, I wanted to, yeah, so, is it a good analogy to think about this kind of inequality between two tensors, let's say, somehow, as uh, saying that if you have one polynomial that you can compute, then, then you can reduce computation of yes. some other polynomial? To the yes. Yes. And, and in fact, in this, these, these notions make sense in the polynomial setting, and they're used there. Um, So, Jim, can I ask, so this R polynomial will be what? Will be this sum of powers, or it will be... It will Maybe you should write it down. Yeah. Maybe you should write it down once, what this unit tensor is. Just say coordinates. It, this one. Yeah. Oh, th this one. So I'm in now. This lives inside CR, tensor CR, tensor CR. And it's just the three-dimensional matrix with ones along the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. For polynomial, it's the sum of cubes. It's the sum of cubes, It's the sum of cubes, right? sum of cubes yeah. yes. Yeah. And this makes sense for arbitrary number of factors, too. Yeah. Um, I kind of diverged from my notes quite a bit. <laughs> How many miles? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very far. But I, I would like to... Um, yeah, let me, let, 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 let me just make a few more comments. Uh, because I, I, I wanted to talk about some, some inter, interesting uses of geometry that happened recently. You'll be hearing others uh, during the week. Um, so if I have a three-way tensor, uh, if I call this A, B, and C, I could also view this as a linear map from A to a space of matrices. So the image is, uh, usually it's an n-dimensional subspace of the space of M by M matrices. And so these things have been studied a long time in linear algebra. Well, maybe they didn't study spaces of, of matrices, but for example, if there's an alpha in A star that the rank of T of alpha is M, that we could change bases so that T of, T of alpha is just the identity. Is, is, is this matrix, and then we could use it to identify B with the dual space of C, and now we're dealing with endomorphisms. Linear maps from a vector space to itself, and we have a space of such. And, well, the good news is, is linear algebra has been studied for a long time, and um, Strassen, in 1983, uh, used this to get the first non-trivial lower bounds 
for uh, value, for cost. So the good news is, is that he was able to prove these lower bounds, but the bad news is, is he, he kind of needed to rely on this. Uh, and um, since then, Uh, there's been uh, many advances um, that that made more progress uh, but then uh, around I don't know let's just say 2010 uh, there was a, some kind of wall that stopped further progress or barrier as it's sometimes called and um, the question is how to go further. So this advances, by the way, I should say, used this representation theory. And how to go further, well, now there's a proposed path via um, something called deformation theory. And so hopefully in the next few years we'll see some, some things. But nonetheless, uh, there's this whole issue of cost. We could look at tensors of minimal cost say M, and there's three questions here I could ask, and this first one is, is not at all interesting because it's just what you get by changes of bases, but the second one turns out to be quite subtle. Uh, the first person who made progress beyond Strawson, uh, well, Friedland, where M equals four. So M equals three Strassen, M equals four Friedland. And then um, using this deformation theory, uh, Yelishev, uh, myself, and my student Arpan Pal uh, did M equals five, but the, this is a much higher octane uh, machinery that was needed to make this next step. And the next few steps also look possible, but it's quite challenging. And then um, this other thing is without this, we could ask what do tensors without T of alpha having as a matrix rank M look like? Well, so we have some sub subspace inside our space of matrices. A bounded rank. That is, I have an m-dimensional subspace of m by m matrices such that no matter what linear combination of elements I take, I never get something of full rank. And this is studied, this is studied like for a long time. I mean, there's probably you know, 100 years or so. And, um, So the, the last progress, say, of a bounded rank 
less than or equal to r, was 1983 uh, in the linear algebra community. Uh, for r less than or equal to 3. And then, uh, despite the literature, I mean, there was papers by people like Eisenbud and Harris. Uh, there was no further progress until, well, 2023. Uh, uh, Amy Huang, myself, uh, we classified r less than or equal to 4. And... Um, we used some fairly sophisticated tools. Uh, we used uh, some commutative algebra. Uh, more precisely, theorems of Buxbaum and Eisenbud. So the, and I, the reason we studied this problem I mean, it's a beautiful question worth studying on its own, but the reason we studied it is because of the complexity of matrix multiplication. Oh, oh, this is raise hand robot. I thought I just saw raise hand. I thought somebody had their hand. Okay, um, and it's led to this study here and this study here has led to new, very explicit, like handwritten tensors that have had really unusual properties that I think will be of interest in and of their own right. Now, I think I've long, so I did mention five minutes on my own work. Uh, and I think I better just stop here. Thank you for your attention.